Uh, thanks for the great introductions by Ben. Thanks for the invitation from the TMA. I think Sandy's gone. And uh, I think Dr. Zakowski and Dr. Sadowski have done fantastic jobs sort of preparing for this, for this uh, part of the talk. Um, I saw earlier that there is a lot of questions, or at least faces that look like it, what, nobody really knows what is F FES. And uh, I learned that at the lecture a couple of years ago when I spoke for a whole hour on FES, and at the end of the hour I asked who knows anything about what FES actually means, and turned out there were only four people in the room who did. So, <laughs> so let me just, by a show of hands, I mean, who is familiar with FES, or functional electrical stimulation? So that's, that's, less, that's less than half of the room. So, so before I dive into more like what the basic science on this is, uh, so functional electrical stimulation, or FES, uh, how we usually refer to it, and Dr. Sadowski kind of pointed out all the, the benefits of it. In, in the simplest way, what we do, we are able to stimulate a muscle uh, or a nerve uh, with an electrode and, and induce a contraction, so a movement. For example, if I put a, 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 an electrode on, your, on my biceps, and the biceps is the muscle that kind of pulls the arm up, then I can turn on this, this electrode, and even if I don't have voluntary action to actually bring the arm up, I can do this with the use of the electrodes and the anti-stimulation device. And you can do this pretty much for any muscle in the body. Um, the most common ones that we use for people who have full arm function but very little leg function or trunk function you can put it on your quadriceps muscles, kind of to straighten out the leg, uh, or on the hamstrings, kind of to bend the knee. And uh, in, in a therapy setting, we use this technique to activate these muscles in the, in the right sequence, in a way that they can actually induce a function. The most simplest one, as Dr. Sadowski pointed out, is for grasp. You know, if I, if I use electrodes to kind of stimulate the muscles to kind of bend my fingers, so you can actually reach out, grasp something, put it in a different bucket and release. So this would be a functional electrical stimulation type uh, yeah, environment. The most, so FES comes in all kinds of different shapes and sizes. So if you go uh, in, in the rehab centers, you see all kinds of devices. You have the cheapest ones, these tiny little boxes, uh, that come, two cables come out, which can lead to two electrodes. They cost around about $150. Then you can upgrade this to more sophisticated devices that have more channels or more wires that come out of them uh, that cost about $800 to $1,500. And then you have the really expensive parts, like you, when you go outside here and you see the uh, restorative therapies company who has the FES bicycle, which can stimulate up to about 10 muscles at the same time or 12. And those devices cost between $15,000 and, and $35,000. So it's, there's a wide range, and so in, in, in therapy, in, in neuro rehabilitation, we're trying to figure out which device is the right device for you, uh, which muscles need to be stimulated, how do they need to be, need to be stimulated, and, uh, and you know, is it practical for you to take these things home or not? Does it make a bit sense for people who haven't known anything about FES now? Okay. So I think I can advance it this way. So the, the most important concepts in transverse myelitis, and as you all know, this is a rare disease. Um, people are always very concerned when they don't find any doctors out that don't know transverse myelitis. And so, and then to answer one of the earlier questions earlier, you know, what do we do with people, if you go to the doctors, they don't know, they don't know anything about this. Um, there are a lot more doctors out there in the country and in the world who know spinal cord injury. So if you tell them that TM is technically a version of spinal cord injury, so it's not caused by an impact like a fall, um, this one is caused by inflammation. But at the end, the end result is the same. You have a lesion in the spine that prevents the signals from the brain getting to the lower part of the body. So if you go out in your, for your physicians, for your rehabilitation specialists, and tell them you need to see somebody who knows spinal cord injury, or, or tell them, you know, treat me like somebody who has a spinal cord injury, you're much more likely to find somebody in the area. Otherwise, you have to come to Baltimore or you stay here in Dallas. <laughs> Um, so, so if you look at the lesion in the spine uh, after, after an inflammation, so this would be, this would be the lesion that's in, that's in the spine. You see in the spinal cord there are wires traveling all the way up and down. So this is the spinal cord sort of in the, in the cross section. The, the blue thing, the blue stripe is the wire itself that comes from the brain. The brain is somewhere up here. 
and the lower part of the spine is there where the clock is. And so in the area where the lesion is, uh, you see these wires that are going up and down, and there are multiple of them, and you see the lesion itself interrupted some of them. You see they're sort of sitting here, they can't get past. This is where they were interrupted. You see um, that all these wires are sort of wrapped in little yellow hot dog bun type structures. This is, this is the myelin. And the myelin is sort of the insulation of all, all these wires. If you're in your house and you're trying to run a telephone wire from the attic down to the basement, you have all these tiny little wires. Uh, unless you insulate each one of them, you will never be able to make a phone call. And so the same thing occurs, uh, is, is uh, important in the, in the central nervous system. Every single wire that goes up and down um, needs, to be, needs to be insulated. And so the cell type that does that is an oligodendrocyte. And we're gonna, I'm going to show you some, uh, some a little bit closer a little bit later. Uh, it's a long name, so I usually just refer to them as oligos. So the oligos make, make the myelin, make the insulation. And they get, they get injured very likely in, 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 in TM. Um, so you see that these oligos reach out, and one of them can reach out to as many as 40 to 60 wires to insulate them. Um, then you have the, the nerve cells themselves. These are called the neurons. They make the wires, and these are the ones that get interrupted. And, uh, and then there are some support cells in between that sort of provide the right nourishment and make sure what comes in and out of the nervous system. They're called astrocytes. I'll show them to you later. So th in the lesion itself, you know, you usually have um, a, a scar or a cavity that's forming. And we see this commonly. We look at this together in our clinic. Uh, at, the, um, at the MRI, we call this usually, it's seen as like T2 changes. Um, uh, you see that surrounding that lesion, surrounding the lesion site, you, there's a border zone. And in that border zone, there's usually a lot of inflammatory uh, stuff going on. There is a scar, generally, formation that looks really tight. This is all how this looks like under the microscope. There is um, the oligodendrocytes that are sitting out here. The, the yellow ones on the, on the bottom right, uh, they tend to get injured. Um, some of these, some of the myelin itself, the little hot dog buns, the insulation itself is not uh, done correctly anymore. If that myelin is not tight, really wrapped, really, well, it's not wrapped really tightly around the, the nerve, um, it's not efficient. And so electricity can, cannot conduct from one part to the other. Um, then you see that down the road, some of these neurons themselves die um, just because they were interrupted at this, at this level. And uh, then the big question always is, everybody thinks in the spinal cord that you have a lesion, let's say, like in the middle of your spine, like your thoracic five level. And everybody always thinks that all the problems that are happening in, in transverse myelitis are just at that one level. Uh, people who have transverse myelitis know that this is not true. There's actually things affected all the way up and down the cord. And if you look at this very closely under the microscope, that's, that's actually very true. So if you cut the cord uh, between, like this is between uh, T7 and T11, so thoracic 7 and thoracic 11, um, these are cross sections of the spinal cord. You sort of you see this little butterfly structure in here, which is the gray matter, uh, and this is cervical, thoracic, one, so upper thoracic, then the mid thoracic levels, and all the way to lumbar five. So we're kind of surveying the whole spinal cord from top to bottom. And in this picture, you see anything that is white means that there is inflammation or, uh, or uh, reorganization of tissues going on uh, several weeks after the, the, uh, the insult itself. And you see that even though the injury was between T9 and T11, T7 and T11, um, structures all the way up to cervical two, as low as all the way down to lever, lumbar five are affected. So this is a condition where the whole spinal cord is essentially affected. And so we need treatments sort of that, if, that uh, actually target the whole cord. So the next very important concept in, in, in neuro rehab for TM is how much repair do we actually need? Everybody always thinks we have to fix the whole cord and uh, figure out you know, you know, how can we fill this cavity, how can we recreate all these connections. It turns out that we don't need a whole lot of connections uh, in order to have function. The, uh, the most prime example is for, for walking. So we always think that you need the brain to walk, but we don't. 
and whoever came to my first talk here a couple years back uh, remembers, and I'm not sure if I, if I can cite this, but if anybody ever grew up on a farm and uh, had a chicken, you know, that kind of lost its head for some reason. Uh, <laughs> 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 they, they, can, they can walk. And so the reason is because the program for walking is in the spinal cord, and it's usually in the lumbar spinal cord. And this is where Dr. Zakowski's kind of research is, is begin to, it's called the central pattern generator. So this is a microcomputer in your lumbar spinal cord that generates the program for walking. All you need the connections from your brain for is to tell this program to turn on, turn off, or modulate it. So turning on means start walking. Turning off means stop walking. And the modulating it says go faster, go slower. This is the signal that the brain does. Everything else happens at the spinal cord level. So overall, we don't have to fix the whole spinal cord. We just have to fix a couple of these connections. And if you remember the first picture, where we had some of these wires going across the lesion site, some of them had lost the insulation. They were just blue and bare. If we can just re remyelinate some of these fibers, you get actually a lot of uh, function back, even without repairing the whole thing. So this is a typical MRI of, uh, of, a, of a young woman or a young girl who was 10 years old who had transverse myelitis, and you see these tiny little holes, or this tiny white stripe in the, in the spinal cord itself. Uh, to kind of orient yourself a little bit, the brain is sitting up here. These are the, the bones of the spinal column, these little square-shaped guys. This is what you know from your skeleton. And then in between the flat, the flat things, these are the discs in the, in the spinal column. Behind it, you see this long canal with this, with this gray, gray structure here in the middle. The gray structure in the canal is your spinal cord. And what you generally want to see is a, a very boring, homogeneous gray, like it looks down here, like here or, or up here. And then you see in the spinal cord here, I'm gonna make you all experts now for TM, um, you see this, this tiny white stripe that's in the center of that cord, right? And so that's abnormal. That's sort of the, the cavity or the scar that we usually refer to in, uh, in, in clinic. And if you now take a slice cutting this way, you want to, because you want to see where is that little white stripe, you see it in here, this is the spinal cord itself, that oval structure on MRI, and you see there's this white spot in here, this is where the, the hole is. And if you go a little bit lower, you see there's actually more than one, there's like here and here. So overall for the big spinal cord, you see this is actually a very small part of the cord. But in this, in this particular case, it, it was very, very significant because mo the child had lost most of, most of its function. Um, what's always important, what I'm trying to tell in clinic, is that the MRI that we have currently does not predict outcomes. So whatever you see, it just helps us to decide, you know, what is the structure of your cord right now. But it doesn't predict what your current function is, and it does not predict what your future function is going to be. You know, we're working on those MRI techniques. They don't exist yet in, for, uh, for regular patient care. And so now the, the last big concept that we need for understanding why do we do what we do, why do we think FES and in, including activity-based therapies is such an important thing is because everybody always talks about spinal cord uh, stem cells. Um, Dr. Levy is going to give a talk tomorrow on, on stem cells themselves. Many of my patients ask me, should I go out and go get stem cells somewhere? Uh, it turns out that we actually have stem cells in our spinal cord. They are there. They call it the adult stem cells, and I can take those out, usually in the animal, not in, not in my patients. We can take these cells out, I can put them in a culture dish, and they will grow any nerve tissue that I want them to do. I take these cells, I stick them back in the spinal cord, they don't. I can take these cells and stick them in areas of the brain where we know that there are new nerve cells being born, and they make nerve cells. I take these cells from up there, put them back in the spinal cord, and they don't. So there's something really, uh, inherent to the environment of the spinal cord that prevents them from doing that. And it took us a long time to kind of figure out what is it? What do these cells need to do their job? And if you look at, at healthy people, how fast these cells turn over. So while we're all sitting here, we're making hundreds of thousands of these cells. And we didn't used to know that. When I went to medical school, I was told that we only have, well, we are born with a set of cells in our nervous system. And when it gets injured, that's it. You know, somebody mentioned the two-year mark uh, earlier today, um, and most of you know that's not true. 
So a recovery from this process never stops. Dr. Sikowski pointed this out in Dr. Sadowski earlier, that it's never too late to start these kinds of programs because your nervous system is very plastic and it tries to repair. And the basis of that repair are these cells that you already have. So how do they look like a little bit more in, in, in a culture dish? So the long one that's one of the most important ones for our purposes is the oligodendrocyte or oligo. It's a beautiful cell, reaches out in all kinds of directions and grabs these axons to myelinate them. The, the nerve cells themselves look like the bottom, on the bottom right, they're called neurons. And then we have astrocytes to sort of provide the support structure and the nourishment for, for the whole section. So in order to kind of understand how does activity-based therapy work or how does FES work, we, we had designed a, an animal protocol, uh, an, an animal model, where we implanted an electrical stimulation uh, stimulator, an FES device, into rats. Uh, we gave them a spinal cord injury and we were looking what happens in the, in the spinal cord that is completely separated from the brain if we apply electrical stimulation. And if you look at that, I, that's, very, that's very complicated. I'm not going <laughs> to talk you through this, through this picture. But the bottom line is if you have a spinal cord injury, with, with, um, if you look at the stem cells after a spinal cord injury below the level of the lesion, so if the level of the lesion is at T9 and you look at the spinal cord below, you will see, number one, that if you don't do anything, the, the cell turnover that happens normally, where these cells sort of re rejuvenate and repair the spinal cord at all times, drops down by about 50%, 60%. So this system, and that kind of explains why is the system so inefficient in repairing, because if the system itself has trouble maintaining itself, I mean, how can it be efficiently in repairing? So now if you add functional electrical stimulation that targets this area of the spinal cord, you will see that you can now reverse that process. You can actually turn on these stem cells and make them start proliferate. And as you, so as they proliferate, they actually go to the center where the, where the injury is and start repairing. And we think this is the basis why people get function back with, with, these, with, with FES programs. So, so now that we know that, uh, that we have cells that are in there, that we can stimulate them, what do they need to do their repair job? And so this is a more simplified way of looking at the first picture. So again, we have the, the wires themselves. This time, they're gray. Um, you have the insulation, which is the Lohatak bunch structures. They are in yellow. The oligodendrocyte, that the oligo, that makes these structures is, is in yellow here too. And you see sort of how they reach out and make myelin. And then we have the red cells in between here. These are our stem cells. They're sitting all across the, the spinal cord. So this is kind of in a normal, in a normal picture. So now if you, if you, if you uh, get inflammation, you kill some of these oligodendrocytes. So like, like we do in, in transverse myelitis or in other demyelinating diseases, um, what happens? So the oligodendrocytes, from being there, you take them away. Now you see suddenly you have these bare wires uh, up here. So you see a bare wire here. You see one is sort of interrupted here and here. So you will know that these wires now cannot conduct electricity from up here, where the brain is still be, <laughs> and down where the clock is, where the, the bottom of the spinal cord would be. Uh, you see there's no, no information flow that can, that can go on. So what we want to happen is this. So we want these stem cells, so they're sitting out here. We want them to move to the side where they need it. And then we want them to become oligodendrocytes, right? And then we want them to remyelinate. So this is the, the typical picture that we're trying to achieve. So but what happens really? So in these, in, in these inflammatory uh, spinal cord conditions, we know that these cells are actually smart enough to, to move to the site. So they, re they recognize there's injury, and then they move there. But the problem is then they just sit there. So they don't do anything, or if anything, very, very slowly. So it took us a long time to figure out what do these guys need in order to do their job. So it turns out if, if these wires that they're trying to, that they're supposed to repair are not active, they can't see them. So if they can't see them, they can't repair them. So this is where the concept of FES, activity-based therapies, like Dr. Sadowski introduced, comes in. If we can, what can we do to activate these wires? And FES is one of the most uh, efficient way of doing that. Um, 
Then these cells suddenly say, oh, there's something I need to, need to repair. Um, so you activate them. Now they become oligodendrocytes. And now they will, uh, will start repairing, which ultimately will, will help in, in restoration of function. That's, that's the way that, that we understand that FES and ABRT activity-based therapies work. So this is uh, adapted from Dr. Sadowski's earlier picture. And uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful cut in with uh, Dr. Sakowski's from earlier. If we try to plot uh, activity on the, on the, on the x-axis of this and regeneration on the y-axis, uh, we know that, let's bring this up. We know that with, uh, uh, if we increase activity, that we should get more and more regeneration. You know, we kind of move this, this, this point, this dot from up down here where you are, and if you had transverse myelitis, up this curve. And you know, we, we're trying to do anything that we can uh, from a rehabilitation, rehabilitation standpoint, kind of move this point up and faster by increasing activity. And we think at some point we probably reach a maximum of activity, and then if you do maybe too much, it might get worse. It's always a very common, it, it's a very common question. So, that people always get, and many therapists still teach that, where they say, you know, there is some point when you do too much and you're gonna actually hurt the system. We have been trying in the laboratory uh, to reach that peak, actually reach this side of the curve. So we first we tried it in people, well, we can't do it in people, it didn't really work out because we couldn't do as much activity. Um, then we tried it in animals, so we stimulated animals as much as we could. All we could do is push this thing up the curve. We never hit the peak, we never went down. And we thought, well, maybe if you can't do it in animals, maybe we can do it in, in the tissue culture. You know, you put them in a dish and just stimulate them. And uh, even the tissue culture level, we have not been able to reach that maximum. So I think this is a theoretical site, but I think practically it's, it's not easy to, to achieve. And, and what do you do if you're, if you're having transverse myelitis and you are, let's say you're completely paraplegic from like a mid-thoracic level, um, what you're trying to simulate is what you would do normally you know, if you weren't in your chair, what would you do? You'd be walking, you'd be climbing, you would be doing anything, but how much do you really do in, in rehab? Even in the best rehabilitation program that you have, in the best home program, you would probably never even come close to what you would do if you were, um, you know, were able-bodied. So I think from a practical standpoint, we don't think we can reach this. So the, the second thing that Dr. Sikowski pointed in, there are some people who, um, you know, we, we exercise them and exercise them because exercise is part, physical exercise of, of activity-based therapies, and uh, they don't get much better or, or just a little bit better. And so we looked at this recently, and this is why I'm so, so pleased actually working with, with uh, the TMA because they funded one of my studies where we're looking at uh, electrical stimulation and the response of growth factors in the spinal fluid, uh, which is sort of our marker of repair. And it turns out that if you, if you just apply exercise, I mean, we all should exercise, I and mean, it gives us some benefit, which I think pushes this little mark, this little red dot, up the curve. Um, but it turns out if you combine regular exercise with functional electrical stimulation, you, you go up a whole different pathway. So actually the, the recovery is probably faster and probably more extensive by adding FES. So exercise is good, but I think a combination of exercise with an ABRT program, like pointed out by Dr. Sadowski and, and Dr. Zakowski, um, it's the way to go. And you know, all you need to find is a therapist and a, or a team of therapists, hopefully a team with a, with a physician knowledging, knowledgeable in that condition to help you guide these programs. And that's why I want to leave it. Thank you. <laughs>